Hey folks, welcome to my Don't Starve Together pacifist challenge. Like many complex topics in Don't Starve and real life, pacifism can be a little subjective because different people have different ideas of what constitutes violence or harm. Dharmic philosophers have been studying this stuff as part of the core doctrines of Buddhism, Jainism, Hinduism, and Sikhism for almost 3,000 years. And even they don't agree about all the details. So I'm not going to pretend my rules are definitive, but I'll try to outline them here so that you folks know what you're getting up front. Rule number one is that I can't kill any mob. For purposes of this challenge, a mob is anything that has at least one hit point and can move, from the most innocent butterfly to the most aggressive deer clops. This leaves some entities that do have hit points but can't move, such as hound mounds, beehives, spider dens, slurtle mounds, tentacles, lure plants, eye plants, and the ant lion. I'm making some judgments about these entities case by case. The ant lion seems like a conscious being capable of suffering, so I'm adding her to the protected species list. Tentacles are supposed to be part of some larger subterranean creature we're not seeing that might be capable of feeling pain, and might is enough for me to give them protected status too. I don't think I can make a serious claim to pacifism if I'm going around dismembering things. But the other things on this list don't really seem to express pain, so they're fair game. Lure plants don't even really die when you reduce their hit points to zero. They just revert to their bulb state to be replanted at will. In addition, Don't Starve has lots of things you can do that seem to represent killing things, even if they don't involve the standard game mechanic of reducing hit points to zero. Fish, eels, birch guards, perfectly normal trees, and living logs don't have hit points at all, but they all still have sounds or animations that express pain, so I'm not allowed to go fishing or chopping or burning them. By the same token, I'm not allowing myself to use small captured animals as crafting ingredients if it implies that the animals don't survive the process, as is the case with rabbit earmuffs, the rain hat, and the moggles. I am, however, allowing myself to craft items like the miner hat, bee box, and pumpkin lantern, where the animal used in the crafting recipe is implied to still be alive. Rule number two is that I can't destroy anyone's home unless I can feasibly build a new one right away. For instance, I can destroy beehives to make bee boxes, because the honeycomb I get from beehives can make bee boxes at a one-to-one -one ratio. But I can't generally do the same with pig houses, because they don't individually drop enough resources to build a whole new pig house. I'm making a special case for hound mounds here, because Maxwell has confirmed that the hound mounds are merely surface openings of a much larger subterranean hound nest. I'm also allowed to hammer the giant beehive for honey and honeycomb, since it will always reform as long as the bee queen survives. Rule number three is that I can't deliberately cause the death of mobs through indirect means, such as luring enemies into traps, poisoning them with red mushrooms, or starting civil wars among the pigs. But at the same time, I'm not obligated to save mobs that have endangered themselves through no fault of my own. This is definitely the trickiest of the three rules, and it has a lot of edge cases that I don't think are totally fair. For instance, I'm technically responsible for the deaths of any mobs that fight each other, even if I didn't deliberately arrange the fight, simply because mobs don't fight in unloaded areas. Fights can only start when I'm nearby. This is a mechanic that exists to reduce the game's CPU consumption, and not a diegetic part of the actual story. So I'm going to ignore it and pretend that pigs and merms will hate and fight each other whether I'm around to witness it or not. You see my point, though. The rule gets a little fuzzy in places, and I'd appreciate any feedback from you folks to keep me honest about it. The main goal of this run is to clear all treasure from the ruins that can be obtained non-violently, and make some productive bases to keep me alive while I'm doing it. I'll never be able to reset the ruins, since I'm not allowed to kill the Fuel Weaver, so I'll only have to do this once. As you can see, I've chosen Wigfrid for this challenge, because after trying it with several different survivors in practice runs, I decided that I thought it was most interesting and challenging to do with Wigfrid. If anyone's curious about who was the easiest, it was Weber, by a landslide, for reasons that will become apparent as this run continues.
Making three batches of meatballs with my three remaining starting meats will give me enough calories in reserve to survive for another two and a half days. I'm nowhere close to being out of the woods, though. If I want to live to see another meatball without violating my vow of non-violence, I'm going to have to find some meat that died naturally, and I'm going to have to find it quick.
This is probably going to be the biggest challenge of the run. I'm not allowed to kill hounds either directly or with tooth traps, but it's almost impossible to shake their aggression without redirecting it to other mobs, such as spiders, bees, or beefalo, which would violate rule number three. Even if I could shake their aggression peacefully, they'd never despawn, and I'd lose access to the part of the map that they occupy forever. So what am I to do? Entering the caves after the hounds start baying, but before the hounds have actually spawned, causes them to lose your scent and never spawn at all. Mechanically, this is because changing servers interrupts the hound spawning process. It's sometimes considered a bug since it doesn't work in single player, but it makes perfect sense to me in the context of the game. Either way though, this isn't a sustainable solution. Sooner or later, the hounds will catch me when I'm too far away from a sinkhole. I'll need to come up with some other trick to deal with them in the long term.
I'm going to make a lot of drying racks in this world so that I can turn morsels, frog legs, and fish into jerky. They'll last longer, and they'll be a nice source of emergency sanity. I plan to spend a lot of summer in the caves, and I'll probably need a lot of redundant sources of sanity to survive down there. last night of fall, and I still don't have enough silk for a sewing kit. This could be tight. I'll have to be careful with the durability of my thermal stone and my winter hat.
Not a single silk from the tumbleweeds. I've got no choice but to try the swamp again now. I've got all the silk I'll need for the rest of the winter, and probably for the rest of spring. Now I just need to not freeze to death on the way home. Awesome. That about wraps things up for this episode. But before I go, I'd like to mention my good friend Andrew. He's already had a considerable presence on this channel behind the scenes. You might know him as the guy who composed my intro theme, and composed several tracks that I've used as background music. You might also know him as the guy who very patiently allowed me to murder him over and over again to get some of the shots from my Don't Starve video essay. He's done his own video essay now, about Undertale, since we're on the subject of games with a pacifist option. And if you like my stuff, you'll probably like his. Give him a watch if you're interested. Later!